Okay, if I could get everyone's attention for just a second. We don't have too much time and we have such an exciting panel. I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but I just wanna welcome you here on behalf of the US Embassy. Uh, the future of education is, is really a critical issue in the US-Irish relationship. And at the Embassy, we're, we're proud to encourage more forward-leaning uh, activity in this area. So thank you for coming. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to your moderator, Jill. Okay, hey, good afternoon everyone. I hope you're all well rested and well fed after lunch and ready for an engaging and an exciting conversation. I've heard some of the preliminary chats that are going on here behind me for the last few minutes and I think we've got an exciting hour ahead of us. So um, I suppose obviously we're here today to talk about um, MOOCs, online learning and MBAs that can be earned on an iPad and basically then what is the future of the university arising from this, okay? So we're going to have a very active discussion. Um, my name is Jill Haynes, I'm from University College Cork, and I'm here in my capacity as manager of the Eureka Centre down there, which is an outreach initiative that we have where we engage with primary school, secondary school students, teachers, um, people working in STEM, and trying to bring all of those different stakeholders together in this space where they can work together moving forward. So um, that's one aspect of what I do. Uh, before we go any further, I'd just like to uh, introduce you to my colleague over here, Kerry McCusker, sitting in the front. Kerry is going to help me to curate this session. Kerry is a PhD researcher at the University of Ulster, focusing on improving how STEM subjects are taught using personalised and adaptive e-learning with games-based learning. Kerry is actively involved in the promotion of STEM subjects, which involves a role as a STEM ambassador and a mentor for widening access schemes promoting STEM in both primary and secondary schools in Northern Ireland. Okay, so Kerry's going to help us a little later on with our Q&A session. So just to give you a brief overview of the format of how this session will run, I'm going to introduce you first of all to our three panellists, and then each of them are going to address you for maybe just about five minutes, just to, you know, um, put forward a few ideas, give their thoughts on this topic of the future of the university, and then we're going to very much open up the discussion to the floor and hopefully have a very engaging and interactive Q&A session. And then about 10 minutes before the end, um, I'm going to just bring the discussion back and maybe ask our three panelists to wrap up and maybe summarize what we've talked about or where we see this area going forward. Okay, so first of all, immediately to my right, I'd like to introduce Mike Ferrick of Allison.com. Mike is the founder of Allison, which enables high quality interactive education and training to be provided with free access online. Mike also founded YAC, www.yak.com, a leading unified messaging telecoms company, which was acquired by J2Com and ASD in July 2007. Also Advanced Learning, www.advancedlearning.com, a leading global provider of interactive multimedia courseware for IT literacy, and Ireland Reaching Out, a project reunifying the Irish diaspora online. He is also a member of the Clinton Global, Clinton Global Initiative and the Global Irish Economic Forum. In the centre then is a very good colleague of mine, Professor Betty Higgs from University College Cork. Betty is the Interim Vice President for Teaching and Learning at University College Cork and is the Co-Director of Unad Barra, UCC's Teaching and Learning Centre. Betty also works as a Senior Lecturer in the School of Biological, Earth and Environmental Sciences and is one of the Irish Universities Association representatives on the board of the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. She is also a member of the NUI Working Group on Online Education. And then over on the extreme right is Brian McRae, who you will have heard of from earlier this morning from Dublin City University. Brian is the president of Dublin City University and has played an active role in teaching physics and researching the areas of optical chemical sensors and biosensors, <laughs> biomedical diagnostics, and nanobiophotonics since 1986. He is committed to DCU's strategic plan, Transforming Lives and Societies, which was launched in 2012, and deals with issues such as innovation and entrepreneurship, technology-enhanced learning, engagement with enterprise, and a research agenda that addresses global grand challenges. So with that, I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Mike Ferrick for a couple of moments. So Mike, would you like to go Great, here? okay. Great. Thanks a million, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the, to the US Embassy for the invite. A uh, very interesting morning session, and uh, what a lovely, intimate place to have a, a chat. And that's what I hope we ha we're going to have. And uh, so I'm just going to just put out some ideas. It's not really a, a greatly rehearsed speech, but just some ideas that I hope will provoke some thoughts, and uh, we'll have a good uh, chat later. Uh, Alison is, uh, if you don't know, is a free online learning platform focused on workplace skills. 
It now has three million people on it worldwide. We hope to have about five million by the end of the year. And it is one of the largest worldwide. Other people obviously leading the charge are the likes of Casera, EDX, uh, and that. We're based out of the west of Ireland. We have 30 employees. And um, you know, th it's, it's exciting times for us. So when I talk about the university, uh, the future of the university, I want to say, first of all, is that uh, you know, where Alison is today is not where it will be in the future. Um, and as I talk about the future of the university, it's not that actually Alison is competing very greatly with the universities at the moment. But I hope to be, I, I certainly see a lot of what's going on, and I hope that from my platform, I'm able to comment about what I think is coming down the runway for universities. And uh, yes, some, some of it will affect Alison, and some of it may not. Um, the first point I want to talk about is commoditization. There is absolutely no question in the wide earthly world that a lot of the content that's been taught, uh, a lot of the material being taught in university today is going to be commoditized. It's going to be free online and it's going to be taught really, really well. The chances that you're going to pay a university to actually learn that stuff is next to zero. The fact is the universities, most of the universities, their economic model today is based on the number of students that come in to learn this stuff that they can learn anywhere else. That's not to say the universities aren't doing really good stuff, particularly at the higher level. But the generic stuff that can be commoditized, it cannot bet a future on that. That's going to change. And again, it's, it undermines probably half of the, of, of the funds of universities. Serious, serious issue for the universities. How do the universities respond to that? Well, like any business, you really, really have to look at what can you uniquely provide? What is it that the Irish universities provide that nobody else can compete with them worldwide by the web? The logical one is local. You know, there is a face-to-face -face, uh, element of teaching and learning that is pretty much irreplaceable, that they can do. Labs, you might study online, you might learn a lot about physics, chemistry, whatever, but at some stage you'll have to go into a lab, show that you know it. But actually, if we think of any of you have been a science grad and you've done lots of study, how much of, what percentage of the time that you did a degree did you actually spend in the lab? Probably a small amount of it. Well, that's what you're gonna pay the university for. All the rest, you're not gonna pay the university for. So how does the university actually create a model that it supports itself to teach this stuff? Specialization. If you can't, you know, you're going to, a lot of these institutions are going to have to focus locally. But the other thing is actually get really specialized and to be the best of the world at teaching stuff online and in classrooms. How many Irish institutions can really be world leaders in specialized areas? Actually, it's trying hard. You have the likes of the UL doing the Burnell program, trying to focus on very, very narrow areas. That's good. That's encouraging. Other universities are doing it. DCU is doing it quite well. Um, but not that many universities can actually specialize that well because it takes funds. Uh, so that's not an option, I think, for a lot of the institutions in Ireland because they're just not strong enough and they're not funded well enough and they're not run well enough in terms of administration. Competition. We have only seen the beginning of the amount of content that's going to go online. It is going to explode. So one of my points that I'd like to make is that the universities teach today just a small amount of data, a small amount of information and knowledge of what's out there. It, the universities in the current structure are not going to be able to, to teach in formal structures all of the knowledge that's out there. It just, the system can't handle it. It's going to be wide open worldwide. And the university system, as it is today, has to change. The best students are not going to be going to college. It costs too much. They can educate themselves elsewhere. You know, again, they're going to lose a lot of traffic there. Research contracts. A lot of the universities say, oh, we get contracts from this company and that company. Who's to say that the experts on anything is going to be actually still at the university anymore? Because, again, industry is becoming more and more specialized. And the chances are that your local university has a specialist that in a particular area that you want is probably zero. It's going to get that way. So it's very, research contracts are, are probably going to go elsewhere. So already I've just said that 90% of the university funding streams are going to be undermined, and I believe that to be the case. Accreditation, just like an analysis, do you really need to go to university to prove what you know? More and more, more and more employers are saying, come in and prove to us that you have the skills that we need on Monday morning and we'll hire you. Not necessarily that you have a degree that you did 10 years ago. So accreditation is really uh, opening up. Just a few other things that I, I mentioned. Decay. The universe, we're, we're talking in some ways about the universities as if they're in great health today. But grade inflation, for one, is a real issue. I have a, an, uh, a staff member uh, who is going to one of the colleges in Ireland that uh, just finished a course that 100 people did. And 75% got a 2-1. It's like 75%. Now, isn't that, doesn't that make a monkey of, what, of a 2-1? 
It's ridiculous. It's silly. It's undermining the university sector. So when you, as an employer, when I see someone coming in, and I see someone coming in with a 2-1 or a 1-1, I don't believe it anymore. Opportunity of free learning. Second last point. We just did a survey of our learners worldwide. We had about 30, 30 to 40,000 responses. The one thing I really, really liked about the, the responses was that 80% of people that had studied an Allison course felt that their confidence had improved. Nearly 80% said that they, it would encourage them to do further learning. Nearly 20% said that it encouraged them to create a business. These are all people that would not have studied formally otherwise, but yet you have people that are more confident in society, that want to learn more, and they're preparing for the workplace. Yet, to the university system, we've excluded them because they can't afford it, usually. And why should it cost? And the final point, just to be provocative, if I can, <laughs> is just what, should I, what could Ireland do? I'd suggest that every university in Ireland looks at all of the material that it teaches that can be commoditized and commoditize it now and be the leader worldwide in coming out with this stuff ahead of everyone else. So whether it teaches tourism or it teaches chemistry, if there's someone signing on in Botswana, they can go on and they can do a certificate or a diploma in some type of chemistry online for free, but it's at the bottom, it says, provided by X university in Ireland. That person is going to go on to do a master's. Where are they going to think of going? They'll think of going to Ireland. Or at the very least, they'll be, have, they'll be very much uh, um, you know, gra grateful for what they've received. But that's a bit too bold, probably, for the university sector today. But honestly, that's what really needs to happen. So thanks a lot. Okay, Mike, thanks for that. And uh, we had a great session this morning, which has provoked a lot of um, ideas. So I've kind of torn up my notes that I made last night. But um, yeah, we, um, the, the, the universities have had moments of being dinosaurs, I agree, Mike. But um, the, the, the companies like Allison and others are provoking us, and it's a good thing. So we're responding, and we have to think about what is it we provide that can't be provided um, in other ways. So um, I, I hear the, the debates, and I read the, the um, articles about MOOCs, and, uh, et cetera, and then I think about, OK, we can provide OOCs. They might not be massive, or perhaps we'll be happy with books, you know, the big open online courses. So, these things are evolving, and I think it's a fabulous thing. I hear people saying, oh, dis disappointed with them, they're not working, they're not successful, but it's been a fabulous experiment, and lots of different things have come out of the experiment. You know, not everything works, but we have to take risks and try things. And I think the universities are more up for that than people sometimes think. So we're, we're hoping to have a bit of conflict and, and dialogue here as well as agreement. Um, so the future of the universities or the university of the future, there are lots of reports written on that. And one, for example, uh, Ernst & Young um, uh, coming from Australia with, with a whole range of where will we be in 10 years time sort of reports. And everywhere from the status quo to fully online, privatized, profit-making institutions. So where do we want to pitch ourselves? We have to think about where are we going to be. And I don't think there's any possibility of the status quo um, of surviving. But maybe we don't want to go the whole way, because maybe we think we have something that's valuable that can't be fully privatized online uh, and, and, and not coming to, to campus. And I would challenge Mike to be able to replace my 30 students down in West Kerry last week who had a fabulous, hopefully, experience out in the field, collecting, making their own video evidence, uh, making their own resources, and uh, uh, learning, so they told me. So I'm not sure you can do that yet in, in Allison, but um, we, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, OK, well. This is, this is very uh, uh, a good time because yesterday some of us, and I recognize in the room, were at a meeting of the new National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. And there we were discussing the digital roadmap for Ireland, and uh, that is to build capacity in, in the digital space. And what we were discussing, 
after some time was, well, we're not going to say we want to be here on that spectrum that, uh, uh, that we see in the reports. How can we say we don't know what's going to disrupt, we, don't, we can't predict, but we're going to um, state our principles and our values for education, for the learner, what we believe, um, not only from reports and research and studies worldwide, but from our own experience. In Ireland, we have huge experience in education. We know what works. We may not have written the book on it, but we have the experience. We can recognize student learning when we see it. We, we assess, and I, I like the comment this morning, actually, which kind of goes counterintuitive, about actually assessing more, but doing the sort of assessment that um, is valuable to the student, not just the summative gatekeeping assessment. Um, so, the, so what we need to do in the education, in the higher education sector, is write down or articulate over and over again those guiding principles and values. Um, because we're a little confused amongst ourselves, I think. We kind of know them, but we haven't stated them clearly enough. And I'll just throw out a couple, but we need to really um, uh, articulate these and make uh, everyone aware. Because, to be honest, you know, there's great excitement about, let's say, the National Forum. But I go back to my colleagues that I teach with, you know, at the blackboard face, um, and many of them won't have heard of the National Forum even. Um, so sometimes I think we're in a bubble. We today are talking about things. We're all kind of on the same page, but are we just, you know, this, this crowd, this bubble, and a lot of people in, in the country aren't talking the same language. They're getting on, working hard with the students, getting their own experience, teaching their own disciplines, and doing great work. So a lot of great work going on. We need help and resources, and we need to mobilize to grow those great things and work with Alison, work with other people, uh, use what's best. If something can be done online and there's no value of being there in the classroom, okay, let's do it online. And, and of course, there's, there's the whole blended approach as well. But just a couple of um, points to add to um, things that have been said actually this morning, but I, I want to consolidate there are drivers on the universities and the other higher education institutions that are perhaps t taking our eye off the ball. They're coming from government or they're coming from other areas. Um, and we are asked to measure things. So we often, in our busy lives, end up saying, OK, we'll measure things that are easy to measure. And there are a lot of things, a lot of, and, and of course, then what you measure is what gets valued and um, you know we reward what's measurable and when you reach the KPIs and so that whole area really needs um, some thinking about because a lot of what we do the nuances the the what people think is a bit fuzzy is hard to measure and we're going to lose some of that um, if if we just rely on the things that are easy to measure so I, d I don't know if I made that point clearly but um, uh, it's what Stephen, Stephen briefly mentioned this morning. The other thing I'm, I feel strongly about is that, for example, in University College Cork, we have 20,000 students, and then the staff sit around and um, look for solutions to challenges. You know, there is student representation, but we have 20,000 students. Every student is talented. Everyone has some talent. Let's mobilize that talent more. Now, we do some of it, and we do lots of the things that were mentioned this morning, but we need to do more of it. Um, the students, uh, as, as producers, is, 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 is um, you know, a, a kind of catchphrase, but we want the students to be creating resources, working with us more, students in partnerships. There are huge exam huge number of examples of really good work going on. We need to document the examples, uh, we need to grow them, we need to inform ourselves, we need to believe it. So there is still a cultural shift as well um, on some of the things that we're trying to, to move forward. 
uh, you know, from perhaps the old days of, of some sort of elitism to, to, you know, real partnerships and guiding. And, and, and uh, one of the, the quotations I love, gifting the learning to the learner. Let the learner learn. Let us be here to help um, and not be, it, it's not all about our performance, it's about the learner's performance. Can they perform the achievement of, of the outcomes that we've asked them to, to perform? So I think, uh, although I had lots of other um, points, I think they'll come up um, in, in, uh, as we go along. Perhaps I should move on now to, um, to, to, to let Brian talk. So hopefully we're provoking a few uh, little bits of conflict and discussion. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I see colleagues from many educational institutions from around the country, north and south here. Delighted to see you all and, and other friends from around the system. Uh, I was just on jobs.ie there, just looking for my next job. <laughs> Mike, I, I, uh, uh, <coughs> it, seem, it seems I'm going to be redundant very shortly. Uh, um, we joke a lot together, so it, it, it's, uh, I think it's a useful dialogue around the extremes of argument. But um, let, let me give my perspectives on it anyway. I've took, taken the view in preparing for this to start off with looking at really the role of universities, what are universities for, and then uh, trying to look at how universities are and should adapt to many of the changes, the rapid changes that are happening. And I think universities should in general uh, move with the changes happening around them and they should reflect the society around them as well as influencing that society around them. Uh, for any of us involved in education, it's this unique combination of uh, privilege and responsibility. There's a huge privilege in actually being involved in the creation of knowledge, particularly at, at, at third level. Creation of knowledge, a huge privilege in being involved in the dissemination of knowledge. That you can't replace that spark of engagement with students. And thirdly, and increasingly the case uh, the, in the innovation space, that that translation of knowledge created into societal benefit. And I think that notion, which is the first point to make about the role of universities, of, of being the engines of, in of innovation, the knowledge enterprises, I think will continue to be the case. Um, it's, it's always very dangerous to predict the future and, and you wonder, well, what future are you talking about? How far is it out there? Um, or the famous statement about the future, the future is already with us, it's just poorly distributed. So that changes are happening all the time. So the digital uh, space, the digital developments are actually uh, affecting a lot of what we do. And I'm, go I'm going to finish off by talking about that particular aspect. But if you take the research and innovation space, I mean, the European Commission has just uh, decided on uh, uh, allocating 80 billion euro to uh, research and innovation over the next seven years in Europe, which is really research and innovation to be carried out primarily by the a research performers, which is primarily the university. So that's going to continue, I believe. And as long as those sort of activities are actually leading to the development and fostering of good citizens, good innovative citizens who are net contributors to society, as long as that work is going to lead to spin outs and startups, uh, job creation, economic development, it's, it's still going to happen because the rationale is there for it. So I actually don't think that's going to change dramatically. I do think some things are going to change, Mike, but I'll, I'll come back to those. Before I get to the digital bit, which is really the focus of this afternoon, in terms of trying to predict what the universities of the future will be like, I've picked a number of words that I think are important. I think we will have to be networked and collaborative. Um, and I mean networked and collaborative both on a national basis, as is already happening, but also on a global basis that if we are to truly address the issues of importance to society, the global grand challenges, whether that be climate change, aging, health, food security, these are best uh, addressed not locally in uh, niche labs in a university here or there. They're uh, best addressed by collaboration, by bringing complementary expertise together across, across nations, across continents. And that's what's, what's happening already, certainly at the European dimension and, and across the, the US-Europe axis that's, that's increasingly the case. Um, flexible, in and I, when I talk about flexibility of universities, again, we're going to have to reflect society around us. And when I talk about flexibility, I mean temporal, modal, and curricular. Temporal, modal, and curricular. So that is really society now requires education provision, as is delivered by Alison, uh, any time, any place. 
but that suits some people more, more than others, and I think there's an age dimension to this. But certainly in terms of modality, I think it's going to be a unique combination or a customized combination of face-to-face -face and online. Uh, I think that's certainly be the case. And curricular, I think this flexibility of customizing, as happens fairly regularly in the US, but more so in this part of the world, customizing the sort of education and degree you want uh, at, at third level and, and beyond. Engaged, and I think one of the ma major changes that's happened in recent decades is the notion of the antithesis of the ivory tower university, where it was a place behind high walls where people speculated about knowledge. That's no longer the case. Uh, it's, particularly for publicly funded universities, we have a responsibility to the societies around us to deliver value to those. And that can be civic engagement, enterprise engagement, part, key parts of the innovation ecosystem. And I think that's increasingly going to be the case because we will come under greater scrutiny, correctly so as funding models get more and more challenging, but we have to keep delivering value. But some of the reports in recent years, from especially UK universities, and we're carrying out such a study at the moment, where you can actually capture the value that universities deliver to their nations, and in particular their regions. All seven universities in the Republic of Ireland are regional in their dimension, in terms of the catchment of students, and in terms of their, of their impact, that they're primarily regional. And the last word then, and one I'll spend most time on, and I won't delay too long, is around the digital space itself. Um, I mentioned this morning, what is hugely important here is that we're exploiting the affordances of digital technologies to enhance the learning experience. That's, that's, that's the bottom line issue of this. We've taken on to establish the National Institute for Digital Learning, delighted our Ireland's first chair in digital learning, uh, Professor Mark Brown. We were delighted to be able to recruit him from New Zealand and with us here today. I think you're in a session later on, Mark, as well. But that's driven by a belief that the future of learning is blended. It's driven by a, a recognition that the current generation of students coming through us, if some people don't like the term Google generation or digital natives, but they certainly access, process, distill, analyze, information in a very different way than happened 10 or 20 years ago. So the learning experience in the university has to reflect that and leverage the benefits of it. So it's about technology enhanced learning rather than digital content transmission is, is the point I would make. And as I said this morning, you can get into adaptive, personalized, customized learning experiences for students. The MOOC, which is the hype end of this, is really, as Tony Bates, who's a, a great guru in the whole open educational resources and digital learning space, as he says, it's just one tree in the forest of open educational resources. There are massive resources available to all of us and to universities now, and I would absolutely agree with Mike. We have to embed the best of that into our programs. We have to embed. So talking to, whether it's Allison or Coursera or Udacity, there are magnificent modules available there at relatively low cost that we couldn't possibly deliver ourselves. And I think what will emerge is some sort of hybrid, and this is the key word I think, is it's a hybrid uh, exploitation of the benefits of the on-campus experience and the social development. I, I, I know from knowing most of you in the audience that you've all been through a university. You probably don't want to tell the things you learned at that university, but you all develop personally dramatically during that time. And parts of those experiences, many parts of them, clubs and societies, uh, engagement with individuals, the, the international development, the, the, uh, dimension of this, you couldn't possibly do online. But you certainly can enhance that learning experience on campus, particularly on a collaborative basis. Uh, so one of the things we're trying to do is to look at social entrepreneurship and addressing social international challenges in the developing world by having students collaborating, say, in India or sub-Saharan Africa, using the digital, the affordances, again, of digital technology. So I think that whole space is, is, is one which is evolving. We're all learning. When you talk to edX, which is this unique combination of Harvard and MIT, they will tell you what they've developed and, and invested between 50 and 100 million dollars in is one large experiment. It's one large experiment, and they're learning from it, because then you can get into the data analytics and the learning analytics of it. But I'm going to finish off appropriately, given this is a US embassy event, by quoting uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton at a, a, a major address she gave last week. Uh, she says, um, technology is a tool, not a teacher. It cannot replace, as Mike says, laboratory-based experiments. And she questioned whether or not it could do a, as good a job as a teacher in encouraging creativity. So one of the things we want to do is stimulate creativity. Uh, she said, uh, as of March 2014, there is no substitute for the kind of learning that can take place in a well-taught classroom. And I would resonate with, with a, lot, a, a lot of that. And I think what will change is the nature of what happens in the classroom. I do believe in flip, flipped classroom concepts whereby students can do a lot of learning online outside the classroom, but the learning experience inside the classroom gets enhanced, the nature of the educator changes, the physical spaces in the classrooms will change dramatically. 
I think that was mentioned a bit this morning, I think they will be unrecognizable. So they unidirectional, a bit like here, transmissive nature of a classroom, that has to go. So the collaborative peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, like Professor Eric Mazur, a physicist at Harvard does now, he, all his lectures now are based around three questions he comes in and it's a discussion with tools and laptops around it and people collect, collectively coming to the conclusion. That's where we're going, I think. So it's a hybrid future. Final thing on sustainability, it is a huge challenge, but I think the, the kind of dimensions you were describing, Mike, were much more reflecting the, the bigger $3 trillion debt situation in the US that's uh, really affecting what's going to happen, their model. We're not at that point yet in Ireland. 44% um, of all students pay no fees, and those that do pay a student contribution, it's less than 3,000 euro. It's not a sustainable model, but at least it's a long way from the US situation. So I think in terms of a, the funding dimension of this, it's, 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 a, it's another longer issue. So sorry for going on a bit there, but I just thought it, to draw together those dimensions of the future of universities, I thought it might be useful. Thank you. Great, okay, thank you to our three panelists. I think we've had some very interesting points and um, differing viewpoints as well. So I think we're very well poised now for an interesting um, discussion and debate. So I'd like to open it up to the floor and to invite you to um, address our panel with any questions that you have. And Kerry will have a microphone and she can walk around and pass it to you. So is there a rush for the stage to show of hands with questions? <laughs> we have one over here, Kerry. Yep. Could I ask for your comments about the new initiative, Uversity, which, if anybody hasn't come across it, is a model where students can come in and select modules from across the Irish education sector. Um, because it seems to me that they've run into quite a lot of barriers, and one of the barriers being thrown at them is um, academic coherence. Now, that to me um, sounds like people are still in the mindset of of they learn what we tell them and what we think they need to learn rather than what they may choose to learn. So if people wanted to come to university and do solid state physics and Chinese and international patent law, that may be regarded as completely academically incoherent, but there may be an innate value for the individual in doing that. So could you talk a bit about what you think will happen to university, whether we're ready for that kind of initiative um, and how it might develop in the future, given the structures within the universities around funding models and RAM models and that kind of thing. I think I, I've been voted to comment on this one. Um, Mike, I'm not sure if you no, I've got. he's going to come in then. So, so for those that may not know what university is, it's, it's a very interesting concept that emerged uh, driven by uh, Dermot Desmond uh, out of the, the first global Irish economic forum. And this, this notion, it's going back to what Mike said earlier, there are distinctive strengths in Ireland, particularly around the creative arts, uh, performing arts, creative arts, uh, music, dance, literature, and so on. And if you're trying to sell Ireland as a, an educational destination online or physically, but this, this, this started fully online, but it's not much more physical, uh, you would focus on that space. And I think that's a great idea. And the concept is that a, the Irish universities institutes of technology and other colleges who are relevant would come together and offer a single menu um, to international students coming in. So you could start to compete with the, some of the major uh, programs in the world in this space. It, it's taken a while to get right. I think the, the, the term academic coherence may be an oxymoron, but uh, um, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of autonomy and independence, but, but, but nevertheless, I think all seven universities and a good number of colleges come together and signed up to be in the dialogue in terms of offering programs. Now, you mentioned solid state physics, physics and all of these other things. It, it's not, as far as, no, it's, it's solely within the, the ar so arts and Oh, sure. I mean, to my understanding is, well, certainly we're supporting it, and to my knowledge, most are. There will always be, doing something for the first time, there will always be some difficulties, but I think the concept of selling that distinctive feature of Ireland in a collective basis, because no one university can do this properly. Personally, it would have my support because I think uh, the strength is, is, is in the, the whole is much greater than some of the parts in this place there. And it, it, is, um, it should come through to fruition. I think it will. So. But it's very disruptive in terms of funding models in the university where the funding follows the student and the student is moving between sure, multiple but, different but one thing you will see, I guarantee you, uh, 
probably in the cycle of the next government is dramatic changes in the funding because the current model is not sustainable. So I think it may be like the healthcare model of following the patient. I think money may well end up following the student and that may not be such a bad thing. Just to add to that, and I, I would agree, I, I, I like the student to have choice, and if this is something that somebody wants, it's a good thing. Um, I think what we add to that in, in the universities is, is um, our understanding of how students learn, because sometimes things are driven by the economy or the choice, and um, th there's a lot of uh, understanding now about the fragmented landscape of learning. So how, how students um, can integrate the different things they're learning if you're learning very different things, you know, Chinese and physics or whatever it was you, you were saying. Um, uh, you know, are they making the connections we think they're making? Are they making meaning connections or are they just silos of learning? And this is where, um, you know, we, we have programs or we have understanding or we have um, intentional teaching um, to help build capacity to make the connections between the different parcels of learning. And uh, I, th I think that, that is something that um, is, is, is growing and it's something that perhaps we've always tried to do but we haven't articulated it, uh, but we're beginning to articulate it more because of the, the diversity and choice and the you know, building blocks of, of, of how people are putting together their learning. We want to build this capacity integrative learning. Ms. Betty? Yep. So I'm going to take us a different direction, if that's all right. Uh, a little bit more fundamental. Um, here's something I struggle with. Um, so my background is neuroscience, Breen, not kind of knows this, but so we, we have at our disposal, you know, what we now understand is the most sophisticated learning thing in existence. We don't know if there's anything better than this, right? And, um, and modern neuroscience has only emerged, say, in the last 20 years when we can actually image the brain. And we're only really looking at this scratching the surface, like functional MRIs and so on, and just giving us insights into how the brain learns and how it works and so on. But if you take what we know just in the last 20 years about how the brain learns, and I'll only cite two of these, there's a last, long list of them, and you compare it to how we teach or how we impart knowledge, we're actually doing it completely the wrong way. So, I mean, two, two, two simple examples would be that we're social creatures. Um, we learn as much from one another. In fact, we learn more from one another and our peers than we do from an adult thing. Um, and the second crucial thing is that, and I'm aware of this as I'm talking, is that I'm learning more communicating to you um, than anybody else listening to me, right? Um, the actual act of communication is a form of learning. If you want to commit something to memory, go and teach it, right? So is there value in actually bringing science to the pedagogy? So getting a group of people that kind of know these things and not just react to technology or react to industry telling us we need skills, but actually say, how can we actually build a better learning model for our institutions to implement? And to really put some hard science behind it. And the science is there now. And then from there, start building out a system that puts that into practice. That's my question. Well, I suppose one, one wants to go first. Go right, oh, yeah, ju just make one point on it. I, I think that um, sometimes in, in, in this whole dialogue about education and technology, people go for the more complicated stuff. You know, they talk about uh, adapted learning and all these sort of things that you can imagine that technically are possible. But just to go to the example that you're saying, say in neuroscience, see, the way I'd look at that is that neuroscience has only developed so quickly because only so few people are thinking about it. And even if you had Neuroscience 101, what if, you know, Neuroscience 101, 102, all the way up to 150 was available on the web to get an awful lot more people thinking about it? And at a very basic level, so what does that really take? That doesn't take too much technical innovation. It doesn't absolutely require you to push the science ahead too far on neuroscience itself. But it brings a huge number of uh, extra people into the whole discussion of neuroscience, right? So, it's only answering one part of what you're discussing, but I see the revolution and like, I, I, may I say that I'd only see Alison as, you know, Alison can only address one part of, you know, it's great fact-based learning, right? Yeah. But a lot of the other stuff, it, it can't do. And I'm the, la I'm the first person to say it can't do it, right? But it can do what it can do really, really well. So when I talk, when I hear you uh, talking about that, 
I get excited by na relatively narrow <laughs> areas of learning, but golly, we could explode it to so many people and get, it's a fascinating area. Could we get a lot more people thinking about this? And I'm not providing you with a solution, but uh, what I can help is get an awful lot more people thinking about it with you. So it's a tangential answer, I hope. No, well, that's just okay. Sorry, so to give you one, one example, right, and, and this is just stand off, look at the system, and so on. We're so focused on assessment and measurement and all these kind of things, right? Now, do you measure the time in a child's life up to the age of four before we put them into the school? Do we assess that at all, right? And that's the most explosive time of learning that ever happens. So you, a child goes from the basic ability to interact with the world, right, right through to cognitive reasoning, to language capability, to object manipulation, to motor coordination, all that kind of stuff in the space of four years, and then we put them into school. The, the challenge really there is to understand what's going on in the brain, and this has evolved to a sophisticated capability that we're not tapping into and utilizing. One of the things that we don't do, we don't allow kids reflect and take time. Instead, we push them, push them, push them, content, content, measurement, measurement. The, most, the greatest insights that have come in humanity have come from moments of reflection and moments of contemplation. And what do we do? We do the opposite. That's just one simple idea from neuroscience that's actually telling us how to do things easier and how to simplify things rather than create anything sophisticated or, or technologically challenging. There are simple insights like that that will actually tell us how to do things far better and generate far better results. That's, that's what I'm pointing my point. If I can just add to that. Um, I, I, I think really um, a message coming from that is that we have to lead, you know, we, we have the understandings and the experience, we have to lead rather than be led because sometimes we are being reactive to the drivers. Um, I, I mentioned assessment earlier, um, meaning, uh, and, and saying I'd welcome more assessment, meaning the sort of assessment we can do in a group like this. We can assess by listening and discussing. And, and the multiple perspectives that are coming are fantastic for the building capacity for integrative learning. Um, now, the, what you mentioned about the peer assessment or the self-assessment you, you were getting at, again, we, we haven't done enough of that. It's not that it's always that easy to do, but we have to keep trying to get that right because, as you say, the person who's peer reviewing or, or peer assessing, self-assessing, is learning as much as the person who's been assessed. So um, I, I agree with where you were coming from, and we need to, um, again, articulate these things and, and, and try and get them better. And not only do what we're doing better, but do better things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fantastically exciting space. It's already happening. Um, I mean, if you, if you think about it, what we're all of us in education are trying to do is enhance the learning experience. I mean, that's, that's the driving force. And we can learn so much from now this intersection of pedagogy and uh, neuroscience. We had a visitor just a few weeks ago, some of you in the audience, but, well, Professor Tom Cruise, Professor of Neuroscience at NYU, came over and was talking exactly about this, where you can get into look at real-time mapping of cognitive function, firing of neurons. You can test uh, approaches to teaching and learning, and you can therefore iterate and, and enhance. It's hugely exciting, and, but it is happening. So th I think that, that's what's important. It's understanding it, and then so it can feed to the preparation of teachers. I mean, there's experts on pedagogy in the audience probably know a lot more about this than I do. But it's happening is the key thing. Sure. Well, we'll definitely move to this side of the room anyway because there are loads of hands up every time I look. So, do you want to start with John and we can come forward then, maybe? Uh, okay, uh, my name is John O'Donoghue. Um, so, my question kind of has two parts. Um, so, first of all, I suppose, what are your uh, views, your opinions on commercialising uh, research and innovation from third level colleges uh, and whether you know, there should be a push towards spin out companies and commercialising that type of thing? At the same time, you know, do you think there's any I suppose, advantage in Irish universities competing with each other when they should be competing on a world stage. Um, in particular, I suppose, when it comes to commercialization and, I suppose, working together uh, to have spin-outs and commercialization from universities. Okay, yeah, well, absolutely. In the first issue, there's no way there should be comp competition between Irish universities. 
uh, they should be specialist and it be the place for people to study in Ireland. It's a tremendous waste of resources. We're a very, very small country. We can't afford it. On the commercialization, it, uh, it, it lends to pick up on a point that Brian, Brian made was with regard to the EU on their 80 billion going into research. They're going into colleges because they have no option, you know, because really they don't have a framework for, co uh, for, for commercial organizations to take this funding. But one of the things that's happening in learning uh, with free online learning platforms is that it allows uh, companies to create certifications on all of their services and all of their products. And, and, uh, and I'll give you an example, just even a, a company that has a high ticket pri uh, product that it sells for $5 million or whatever. Traditionally, they haven't, it's been expensive to create accreditation around that product. But nowadays it can create the course and anyone that's, uh, that works for the people who bought that can make sure that everyone goes through that course and that, that product is used optimally for the commercial benefit of the, co of the thing. That's happening quite a bit. We're working with a number of multinationals that would, would be known to all of you here that are rolling out uh, certifications and pro uh, around their products and services globally because the colleges are not coming to meet their demand. And you know, if you had the likes, for instance, I'll give you an example, the likes of Siemens, right? Say if uh, the ESB buys, and uh, this is in the future, right? <laughs> Say if the, buy, the ESB buys uh, an electrical uh, electric generator, okay? Who's it going to, who's it going to uh, employ? Is it going to employ the guy who has a general degree in electrical engineering, or is it going to apply the guy who has a, a degree equivalent to run a Siemens generator, you know? And the truth is, the ESB guy, it would be clearly, they'll hire the guy with the, uh, the Siemens generator. So I think the workforce is going to get very, very big into education because the colleges and universities in the world are just so slow in coming to work. In turn, let's just go, final point on this. The EU, the 80 billion, what are they putting the 80 billion into? They're not really supporting colleges. They're supporting colleges because the colleges support society to be more productive, to be more prosperous, so we can afford more hospitals, we can, you know, that we can have a better society. If there's a better place to spend that money, not all the 80 billion is going to be going there, and, and it is going to change. Brian? Don't react, don't react. <laughs> 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 no, you, you, you asked some important questions. Uh, first of all, around uh, innovation, it, 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 certainly the, both the, the, the metrics have changed in terms of you know, performance-based measurement of universities and so on. It is now a key metric in terms of translation of knowledge into societal and economic benefit. I also firmly believe that you know, as having the privilege of being able to address big issues, create new knowledge, we should focus on, where possible, um, translating that into benefit. The government has made the decision around research prioritization for the vast majority of public funding, which is just under, under a billion annually, is now going into 14 priorities which reflect national economic priorities. So that's happening. The other thing, just to clarify for you, is in terms of the competing Irish universities, the big funds for research in Ireland are coming in through Science Foundation Ireland. The big funds that they allocate are all into collaborative centres. So they're taking, taking the thematic areas, and Cork has been fairly successful in getting these, but they're collaborations. And it is exactly what you say. So it's it's whether so the, take the biggest one last year, data analytics. We now have one of the world's biggest data analytics centre, an 80 million euro initiative involving UCC, NUI Galway, UCD, and DCU, um, and some of the major players globally in the data analytics, analytics space, collaborating with them. So that says two things. One is the the priority is around collaboration and niche strengths rather than individual small institutions competing, which would be crazy and an ineffectual use of Irish taxpayers' resources. But also that the big companies recognise the quality of what's going on, going on here. And Mark Ferguson, Director General of SFI, who was there this morning, his pr uh, premium metric is, will industries write a cheque, hand it across the table to Irish universities? He says, if you're doing good stuff, they'll do that. If you're not, they won't. And the proof of the pudding is in those sort of initiatives. So. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to have to otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, some, some good points being brought up there, good questions. And, you know, the, 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 the people, um, the, the technologists uh, can be sceptical about the universities, the universities can be sceptical about the technologists, but we all have to be able to answer those questions that were asked. You yeah. know, we need the sceptics, we need to uh, stop and reflect. If, 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 if we can't answer the questions, we're not going the right way. Now, I do believe the universities need their expertise internally um, in the technology because they can link with the pedagogy. Uh, we need those people to link technology and 
you know, the learning experience perhaps that has been traditionally face-to-face. -face. We can't just hand that all over and say we'll rely on the commercial providers because, you know, uh, they, their drivers may not be quite the same as our values and principles I was trying to begin to state earlier. So we have some double thinking going on. We have to admit some double think thinking. People this morning saying we have to be competitive and people saying we have to be collaborative. So we have to recognize productive collaboration and we have to identify destructive competitiveness. So we can't be going around using the two words as though we all know what we're talking about. Um, other double thinking was this morning saying we have everything we need within 15 minutes walk. Well, how do I feel in University College Cork? Because that doesn't include me. Move to <laughs> you, see, you see, and, 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 the, 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 in, in every organization I'm, I'm part of in Ireland, there is a Dublin-centric cent um, view. When it's pointed out, they say, oh, yeah, we, we must do things differently, um, but then they forget. So I'm in a meeting in the NUI, and, the, and I say, OK, next time we have this group together, um, can we do it by video conference? And they say, oh, OK, so the Dublin people come to this room, and the Cork people and Galway people video conference in. And I say, no, we all video conference in, or you come to Cork for the meeting, or, you know. So we have to keep um, questioning ourselves. Are we competitive? Are we productively collaborative? And the clustering that we're being kind of pushed into, there are great things in regional clustering. Some things are good about regional clustering, not everything. I say Ireland is the size of a region in the US. We should be one cluster, but I sometimes get my fingers wrapped by people from other organizations or, or different clusters. Um, we have to keep questioning ourselves and, you know, being questioned. Thanks, Betty. Okay, we're running a little close to our end time, so I'm going to take a couple more questions. I think. Um, no, no? Okay. are you sure? <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, having returned to the classroom after a long absence, the both as a person, as a teacher, as an educator. The, the need to reflect has never, ever been more important as I feel. I'm absolutely pro-technology, but um, not at the expense of reflection and the need for children from a very young age to be able to reflect right through whatever learning cycle they occur seems to have slipped, in my opinion. And yet, it's the essence of, you know, what you, when you talk about assessment, essentially, you're talking about reflecting on maybe what you've just said, maybe what you've just did, or how you've acted. So it's, it's, it's a multiple faceted things. So I think it is, and that area of neuroscience is where it's at, especially when you're using technology and learning, because you actually, when the two combine, it can be magnificently powerful. But as an educator, in the, in the, possibly on the centre or on the side or wherever you are, in the quarterback or wherever, you need to understand that. And the area of neuroscience, I would say, I'm coming from my own perspective of primary teachers, it's, it's, it's probably not investigated, I suppose it's one way of saying it, putting it, but it is, and I think it's particularly important for that whole use of technology and how we embrace it from, from the very young age right, right up through the life cycle. So it's more a comment than a question. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Okay. There's a question over here. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the key takeaways for me was really the comment, Breen, that you made that in my words, and paraphrasing yours, that we really need the discussion about technology focused on what type of education system we want it to serve. And it seems the tenet of the discussion is around a more connected, integrated, um, uh, efficient, I suppose, is not a dirty word either, um, system. And I'm wondering, uh, perhaps the word that probably stands out mostly is flexible in actual fact, um, in all its forms. So I'm wondering if the panel's got some comments around the funding models for universities of the future, recognising that kind of flexibility that's going to be required. Are we going to stay tight-lipped on that one, maybe? <laughs> Is it too difficult no. to predict? Well, I'll take it. Well, okay. I, I think the universities are going to be a lot smaller than they are today. Uh, I think that a lot of what's done in the universities and what the public expects the universities to do will be done elsewhere. 
a lot of people will not be signing up for the night classes at the university because it'll be done online for free. Uh, the research, a lot of that will be gone. I think the one thing that you, we have to really, really protect the universities for is that uh, when I was doing the Leaving Certificate, I, I did a, a, a um, Francis Bacon did a course, or did a, wrote an essay called Of Studies. And I always remember there was one ter terrific line in it, and it says, expert men, can, ha uh, expert men can, haps, can perhaps judge of particulars one by one, but the general counsels and the plots of Martian of affairs comes best from those that are learned. Now, I will not tell you that you will become learned on Alison. I think Alison is a tremendous uh, asset, and it, and it will grow, and it will become more capable. But you are, just through facts alone, you know, will not do that. You need this reflection. You need all of that. But you need to use the technology where it's really, really good and allow it to take away the, uh, the, the costs that are being duplicated. But then it, you need to grow the ability to create learned people. And um, yeah, so. One, one reaction. I'll break my rule here for a second. Um, and, and then one, one answer to, to Margaret. Just in terms of research going out of the universities, I just pose one question. Who will educate the researchers, the future researchers? I just don't see how you, it's an unsustainable argument. You know, universities are where you can uh, diss the actual quality of research going on. That's, a, that's an opinion or based on metrics or whatever. But ultimately, the PhDs of the future coming out to work in research institutes, even if they're outside universities, they have to be educated somewhere. So that, that's one point. The second point is the, the more complex one in terms of what Mark's question about future funding models. Um, certainly, it's clear that the, the Irish funding model, which is a fairly unique one, will have to change. It's, it's going back to the numbers again, there's 170,000 students in third level in Ireland at the moment. And the demographic is going to increase us, certainly, Malcolm's there, out to 2025 20, 20, or 2030, it's going to grow by another 25% or more. So you have the demographic of young people. Ireland, we're all aging, but Ireland is still a young country. The number is going to increase, and actually it's coping with those numbers and maybe stratifying the education is going to be the bigger challenge rather than the falling numbers. So a new funding model has to change. I actually think in, in terms of, of, of your area, Mike, I think, I think some model, again, whereby there are there are assets provided to the student, and maybe the funding going with the student, which allows the student to actually draw on the online model elements, because they're a pay per module sort of model, essentially. That's what Coursera does. It's $25 per module per seat. That's essentially their funding model at the moment. But I think some aspect of that. But ultimately, ultimately, if, if the world is still looking for accreditation of degrees, they want to know where your degree is from, there needs to be some sort of um, objective, largely objective, but accepted a qualification of quality. So accreditation is still the issue that needs to be addressed, and that's another role where I think universities can individually or collectively uh, operate. So. Just, just to add uh, very briefly to that, um, I agree with what's been said, and uh, I think that the, the words coming out from that is that um, universities and technology or online, offline, face-to-face, -face, we have to make the most of being there. Yeah. So um, I, one thing that comes to mind is um, what Graham Norton said when he got an honorary <coughs> degree in UCC. He'd been an undergraduate at UCC. He'd studied French and languages and that sort of side of the house. Um, he, he left af before his second year was finished, so he didn't complete his degree but he couldn't have done what he went on to do without having gone there. There was something there he got, and it wasn't the academic side uh, that we think, traditionally think of academic side. Um, it was coming from the small community and seeing these multiple communities, interacting with them, seeing the different perspectives, the different models, the different ways of doing things, the different values. Um, not everybody was this homogenous group that he'd come from. That's what he got, that was his education, and that's what he valued. Thanks, Betty. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring this um, discussion to a close. Um, I think in a short period of time, we've managed to touch on a lot of different aspects of what is a huge area and clearly a very rapidly evolving area that people from all areas are very passionate about. So, as the panelists, do you feel you need one more minute to say anything that wasn't said, or are you <laughs> happy that we have covered everything that you wanted to say here today? Are you happy enough? 
Do you want to take a minute? Well, uh, yes, if I may. Oh, <laughs> just, just in case just English, very quickly, one minute, in the sense, I think in Ireland we have a great opportunity. I'll be the first person to delay us now. The okay. night we, we have a great opportunity in Ireland. Uh, we could be global leaders in, in education. We could really embrace the free online learning and have all the premium stuff behind it if we act, act it together. I'm not sure. There's a lot of competition, collaborative talk, but I'm not just sure how collaborative the uh, institutions are. And also, we just need to separate this thing of learning and social. We've mixed up education, partly social. Kids go to school. They talk about kids going to Trinity or wherever, and they talk about the value of it being social and the value of being learning. Now, we've put them together. There are more efficient ways of actually getting them learned in, in how they want, and then let them enjoy themselves. I'm not sure that to bring them out into a, a field in Kerry is the best use of the fees that I'm paying for my daughter today. I, I can organize that better, okay? But I, just... I'll bring you, I'll bring you next time. <laughs> but that's my last word on it, okay. I think I need a bouncer up here now, please. <laughs> I understand the, the, the social learning and the, the other learning, how, how they integrate, and so. I'm going to bring him with me to Kerry. Um, and what, what, I, what I want to say is that um, just some things we have to keep putting up there. Each student is an individual. Each one is learning slightly differently, slightly different things, unpredictable things. We have to keep the student at the centre, whatever it is we do. We have all the expertise in Ireland. We can solve what needs to be solved and move on and find new challenges. But um, do not underestimate social learning. Thank you, Betty. <laughs> I agree with all that Betty just said and, and half of what uh, Mike just said. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> on that positive note, one very quick comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you to our three panellists for their very insightful um, comments. <laughs> and thank you all for your participation and the staff of the Embassy for organising this session. So thank you very much. <laughs>